topic of today's class is called the foreheads of the saints and feel free to share the conference number to those who want to learn those who want to get some understanding about who the Israelites are what's what's the purpose of the Israelites why are they God's chosen people why do they have to keep the commandments why can't they be like everybody else send them here we'll go over it they have questions we'll answer them that's what this class is all about. If I can't answer it, there's other brothers who have been in this truth for a while that can answer it. That's on the conference call. There's sisters who can enlighten brothers and sisters. That's the beauty of this conference call. It's a tree with many branches, and it's established by the Most High. This is not the lion's roar per se class. This is the Most High's class. The Most High constructed all these brothers who are teaching this word today. It's all the Most High's. You know, those who teach it in righteousness by keeping the law, statutes, and commandments. That's the beauty of this whole thing. They can't, what you call, like they did in China, they've been trying to send spies and double spies to find out what's going on over there in China, this government. But when it comes to the Most High's word, they can come in all they want to try to see what we're doing. We ain't doing nothing wrong but learning his scriptures. We ain't doing nothing wrong but keeping his commandments. We ain't doing nothing wrong but finding out who our forefathers are and seeing the wickedness that these people have done. All right, let's go ahead and uh, read Colossians 3 17. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all by Hashem HaMashiach Yahushai, giving thanks to the Heavenly Father, the Abba by Him. All praise to the Heavenly Father, Yahweh, and the Son, Yahweh Shai, and the host of heaven that He governs. By Shem Hamashiach Yahushai, all praises. So let's get started. Let's go first to Ezekiel chapter 2 because the children of Israel, we all know that the children of Israel are hard headed. We are a hard headed people. The thing is, the Most High has set men who have faith in his truth, he, has, he made their heads harder than the children of Israel's heads. He made somebody more rebellious towards the ways of the world than their ways towards the ways of the Most High. So that would be us. We are the saints. We are the saints and our forefathers have led the way. And we're going to start off by reading Ezekiel chapter 2. Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 1. So if you have a pen and pad and you need to write this stuff down, do so. You can always refer to it later. And it reads, And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto you. And the Spirit entered into me when he spoke unto me, and set me upon my feet that I heard him that spoke unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel. Listen to what he calls children of Israel. He says, To a rebellious nation, a rebellious then that have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Most High of hosts, and they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for, for they are a rebellious, they are super rebellious, Yet shall know that there have been a prophet among them. That's you, brothers and sisters, on this on this conference call. <laughs> Haven't everyone you spoke to that didn't receive this word come at you rebelliously? That's you. Whether they hear you or whether they don't, guess what? It's going to come to pass what you said. If you tell them, hey, you're going to start seeing more brothers and sisters out there learning this word, it's going to come to pass. If you tell them that the internet's going to shut down because of this word, it's going to come to pass. If you tell them that all shortages in the earth are going to happen because of the Israelites coming into this truth, it's going to come to pass. And when it happens, they still won't understand. Verse 6, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, 
neither be afraid of the words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou doest dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. It's amazing the uh, symbols that the Mosai use. He used these people will dwell among scorpions. He said that the Israelites are like scorpions, basically is what he said. When you think about a scorpion, if you're standing in front of a scorpion, what is the most deadliest part of a scorpion? Is it his head? Is it his feet? No, it's his tail. So you can sit there and talk to the children of Israel, and you're sitting there thinking they're getting it, and what's coming after you talk to them? That lash, that scorpion tail is coming to strike you down. They can't take it. It's amazing. The word, think about the symbols that the most I use, a scorpion. And that sting, that lash will hurt. That's that sorrowful feeling that you get after you talk to them. Like, man, I sat there for an hour talking to this brother. He was getting in. Then the brother just switched up on me. Next thing I know, we was arguing. That's that scorpion tail. Verse 7. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto you. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. Why is he saying do not be rebellious like them? Because Israel could be so hard on you where you it'll make you lose your religion. <laughs> you forget about everything. They've been to cuss you out, talk about your lips, talk about your hair, talk about your eyes, you know, liking you to some kind of actor, liking you to some kind of animal. Israel can get on you. They are the cap masters. Verse 9. And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. Look at that. That's what's coming with this truth. So this is the important part of the scripture. Go back to 6. Look at verse 6 again. Verse 6, it says, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with you. And thou doest dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Their looks can also intimidate you. You see, Jake, they, they can look at you so evil. You know that Aunt Esther look from Red Fox? She had the meanest junkyard dog look ever. Them looks at Israel can make you look pitiful. Jamie Foxx got a mean look too, even though we know him as being goofy, but his look is mean too. Um, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 7. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto you, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impotent and hard-hearted. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. So the Most High is likening our foreheads to be stronger than theirs, because they're rebellious. They don't want to hear what we have to say. Look at verse 9. As an adamant harder than flint, as flint stone, have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Stand your ground is what he's saying. What is that verse in James? Satan will flee when no, no one's resistance. He's still going to flee. They can't stand up to you because the most high's words are in you. It's not your words that you're speaking. Your, your words, would it would have been failed, but it's the most high's words. And you're holding strong to those words, which makes your head hard. And they can't stand up against it. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And let's look at verse 8. And look at this law. 
Let's see what he means when he says, I will make your head harder than adamant flint stone. Let's look at verse uh, seven. It says, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest down, sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Hmm, frontlets. It is talking about binding frontlets on our eyes to keep us focused on what's ahead for us to be what? Victorious, to receive salvation. Ultimately is gaining and being able to enter into the kingdom because you have to stay focused the whole time. So by binding our eyes and our mind, we are conforming our spirit to the Most High Spirit by just following his commandments. These laws have never lost a fight. They've always won. They still is still standing the test of time just by being in front of us. Go back to Ezekiel chapter nine and four. This time we're gonna go to chapter nine this time. Ezekiel chapter nine verse four. We're going to stay in Ezekiel quite a bit today. Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4, and it reads, And the Mosai said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. What did he tell Ezekiel in chapter 2? At the last verse, what did he say? That Let's go there again and let's read the last verse. Ezekiel 2 and 10. It said, And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. Going back to Ezekiel 9 and 4, he said, These are the men and women that sigh and cry for all the what? Abominations that be done in the midst of. Abominations. Those are woes. Those are lamentations. People are losing their lives. Uh, verse 5. And to the others he said, In mine hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark. That mark is in your forehead, that's your spirit. And began at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men, which were before the house. Let's read uh, verse seven. And he said unto them, defile the house and fill the courts with the slain, go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. In your forehead is the testimony that, that you follow. Many people don't know that. They think it's the whole magula obligata, the whole part of your mind, your, you know, the whole thing. But it begins in the front lobes of your head. It's where your eyes are. Okay. Right between your eyes is where that testimony lies. Some have the testimony of democracy or demonocracy in their minds. Some people have the testimony of global warming in their minds. Some people who are in Islam, Muhammad is their testimony. All silly types of testimony are out there. But we have the testimony of Yahweh, while Yahweh Shai, who said in Hebrews 10 and 7, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. And some people stop there, but it says, To do thy will, O Father. Don't let somebody say that and forget about the will of the Father, because that's what it says in Hebrews 10 and 7. And Psalms 40 and, was it, 40 and 8? He says, to do thy will, O Father. Yeah, he comes in the volume of the book to do the will of the Father. It's important. People quote half verses. Tell them to finish it. To do the will of the Father. And, you know, we have to say, do you walk with the Most High? Or do you walk with Satan? You can't finish verses. What, what is sealed in your mind? 
What do you occupy your time with on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, the eyes, they capture all thoughts that sit in your forehead. And from that point, what your eyes capture, that information that sits in you, you have an option to choose your next action, whatever you see that sits there, you are the author of destruction from that point on. When you watch TV or you watch YouTube, how many advertisements pop up? They trigger you or they try to motivate you to follow through with the same idea that they're putting in front of you. You know, how so? For example, you'll see food pop up, you'll get hungry. Oh, you know, I want that right there. You go to the store, you see something from McDonald's, the shake come up. You'll go to McDonald's and order the same shake. You'll see travel, things that uh, motivate you to travel, you know, trees and beaches. Oh man, you know, I want to go there one day. Or even some kind of, of event, you know, you got flyers. These things are just pop-ups in your mind that distract you. Have you ever been on your computer and you clicked a pop-up or a tabloid and it may be about something like an entertainer or something you're curious about. The next thing you know, after clicking on that, you'd be surfing the web for an hour on the subject you wasn't even looking for. It basically robbed you of your time and your attention. Why do you think TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook is so captivating? Because it begins with the eyes and then your eyes connect to your spirit. The next thing you know, you're all headlong on those social media programs. And a lot of times the social media ain't got nothing to do with the truth. You're just sitting there swiping up and down, up and down, sideways. Not to mention the dating site for the people who are out there are looking for a new love. You know, no telling what you might get on a dating site. So there's all types of perverseness out there. And for those who don't have the truth, they are operating. Basically, they're on a roller coaster of destruction. They don't know which way they're going because they don't have the truth. All of it is a form of addiction. When you look at the whole scheme of things, Esau knows what he's doing by allowing this stuff to come out. And it's just to lead people down the wrong road. Now, let's look at Ezekiel 9 and 9 again. Ezekiel chapter 9, we're at 4, we're at 5. Let's go to verse, yeah, let's skip down to 9. Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Most High have forsaken the earth and the most I see if it not. And as for me also, mine I shall not spare. See that? Mine eye. Neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. What is their way? Now our people, a lot of our people, uh, I'll say the majority of our people do not have money to travel for entertainment reasons. Some of us do, but when you look at the majority of our people, we used to have ghettos. Most of our people stay in the same place. You know how it's easy to figure out where our people are? Just look at the fast food chains. Most of your fast food chains are in the ghetto or in neighborhoods similar to urban um, ghettos. When you get into real ritzy areas, they do not have fast food chains all over the place. They may have one. So they kids can work in there. But you look at where all the chains of foods are, it's where the brothers and sisters are. It's almost like a setup, you know. But, you know, we, we have to be a little smarter than what's, uh, what the world is putting out there for us uh, as far as our foreheads go. The sad thing is... Uh, they're doing with this truth is they're putting it in pockets and corners in the social media so people can't find it, especially now. They're getting worse and worse. But before, uh, we were kind of out there. You know, people were able to see it. 
But uh, uh, that's just the way of the world. It has to go that way, the Most High says. Let's go to First Peter chapter 4, verse 17. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17, and it reads, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of the Most High. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of the Most High? It's all about the gospel of the Most High. If our people don't know right from wrong, what's going to happen? Destruction. The Most High said two-thirds of our people are going to die. Why are they going to die? Because they're either going to hear the truth and they're going to be persuaded to do something else. Well, they're not going to hear it at all. But it said that all ears will hear the truth once, at least once in their lifetime. All ears will hear it. Now, verse 18. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? The Bible is here for us to get understanding, but we have to also be able to be strong enough to operate in this world with the Most High's word. It's all about filtration. You got to filter everything that you see. Movies, commercials, people that talk to you. You got to filter everything. It's the only way you're going to save your own life. We're going to get out of here by the skin of our teeth. Second Ezra chapter 14, verse 17. What I love about Ezra is he had a really in-depth conversation with the Most High's angels. And you don't really see that too often in the rest in the 66 books other than Moses. But Ezra's had a real in-depth conversation. And then when you read about it here, this is in 2nd Ezra chapter 14, verse 17. It reads, But look how much the world shall be weaker through age. So much the more shall evils increase upon them that dwell therein. We're in the Apocrypha, by the way. Again, 2nd Ezra's chapter 14, verse 17, in the Apocrypha. I'll read it again. For look how much the world shall be weaker through age. Now, how do we know the world is weaker? <laughs> Think about when Yahushai was hung on a tree and crucified. And when he resurrected from the dead, that began the last days. Did y'all know that? But many of y'all that don't know, the last days began when Yahushai rose from the dead. So through that, darkness has been all over the earth. And with the darkness, our people have gotten weaker and weaker and weaker. But we still stay focused on the light, on the truth, to get to where we need to get to. With or without anyone, we stay focused on the truth. It says, for look how much the world shall be weaker through age. So much the more shall evils increase upon them that dwell therein. For the truth is fled far away, and leasing is hard at hand. For now hasteth the vision to come, which thou hast seen. Then answered I before thee, and said, Behold, the Most High I will go as thou hast commanded me, and reprove the people which are present. But they that shall be born afterwards, who shall admonish them? So he's asking, who's going to admonish these people later on? At this time, they had lost the book. They didn't have the book of the law during the time of Nehemiah and Ezra. When you read the uh, Chronicles, it says that they found the book again during that time, but also the Most High spoke with Ezra, and he allowed him to receive the same information that he gave Moses to rewrite the books. That's the beauty of the Most High. He's not going to let his word be void. He's going to allow the word to continue to dwell amongst his people. So he blessed Ezra to rewrite these books. I read verse 20 again. Behold, the Most High, I will go as thou hast commanded me and reprove the people which are present. But they that shall be born afterward, who shall admonish them? Thus the world is set in darkness, and they that dwell therein are without light. Is the world now without light? I mean, despite the fact that there's small remnants and pockets of us here, but we still got a lot of work to do. You're still seeing aired on TV Christian churches. They're still they're still pushing this gospel that they have in these uh, 
business setting and these business, I'll say business churches, because that's what it is, a business. It's a business operation. They don't teach the law, statutes, and commandments at all. So darkness is still on earth. People are still doing cruel things, evil things. A lot of people have never heard the truth. We got prisons full of brothers who've never heard the truth. We've got establishments full of our people who've never heard the truth. Okay, so I mentioned about the prisons haven't heard the truth, but now the truth is coming to light. Uh, we actually had a prison ministries uh, where we were going to prisons like San Quentin and distribute the truth. Uh, here is a prison in Michigan and uh, it says Michigan prisons must provide kosher meals to Jewish inmates on the holidays. Federal appeals court rules. Now, why in the world would Jewish people be in prison? They always escape prison. They always escape prison because they have attorneys to bail them out in court. They always get a waiver or a coupon, so to speak, so they can get out of jail. So they don't have to go to a maximum state prison. So they're not going to tell you that these Jewish inmates are black and Hispanic brothers who have converted or woken up to the fact that they are Israelites and took on their heritage as being Jews. But what they will say is something like this. Michigan prisons must provide kosher meals to Jewish inmates on holidays. Federal appeals court rules. We all know by us just going into the prisons that we may have seen one Jewish person out of 5,000 inmates. But here you got Jewish inmates right here. Look at this down below. It says a three judge panel on a federal appeals court has unanimously ruled Tuesday that the Michigan Department of Corrections must provide kosher meals to Jewish inmates on certain holidays. Really? Hmm, sounds to me like brothers are waking up and they don't wanna tell people that his brothers waking up, but they rather just say Jewish. The MDOC has been providing certified kosher meals to Jewish inmates since 2019, when the state settled a class action lawsuit alleging that the vegan meal meant to serve as a religious meal for those with religious dietary needs was not sufficient for Jewish inmates who required certified kosher food. So they were already doing this with the Muslims for years and years and years. All of a sudden, now they have this dietary law for Israelites or Jewish inmates. All of a sudden, when we know there are no it's, the population in the prison is not is predominantly black, white, and Hispanic. And the white, that's like seven, eight percent. It's not even that many. And then the other is probably like ten percent. So this is definitely, we know this is talking about African Americans who are now realizing that they are Israelites from the tribe of Judah or Judeans, Benjamin and Levi, and so forth. Let's read the next paragraph. That settlement, however, didn't cover inmates' demands that kosher meat and dairy products be provided on certain Jewish holidays, like Passover, uh, Day of Atonement, things like that. Now, under Tuesday ruling from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, the MDOC must provide such products on the Sabbath, along with the Jewish holidays of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and Shabbat. Most Jewish people eat crab, shrimp, and pork. So you know this is talking about brothers who are following the dietary law in Leviticus chapter 11, where it says, for us not to eat those things. It says here, Jared Ackerman, Mark Scheichen, both MDOC inmates argue that their sincerely held Jewish beliefs required them to eat specific kosher meat and dairy products on certain holidays, such as lox on Yom Kippur, which marks the Jewish New Year and cheesecake on Shabbat, which celebrates the spring harvest and the giving of the Torah to the Jewish people. Now, here's the here's the kicker. You got to get a petition in order for for these politicians to listen. It's the only way they're going to lobby it and vote on it. Where are they going to get a petition of more than a hundred people? 
to hear their demands. Where are they going to get it from? You really got to look between the lines to figure out what's going on here. Okay, that's all I'm going to read, but read between the lines to see what's going on. There are brothers and sisters who are waking up to the truth. When I do classes like this, I have to explain a little bit further for those new people who are watching this who don't believe that the blacks or the African Americans, the Haitians, the West Indians, the Dominicans, the Puerto Ricans, most of them come from the descendants of the Jews. And when I say Jews, I'm not talking about Jews. I'm talking about Judeans. It's a tribe. That's one tribe out of 12. This is a book by Lenora E. Burson. This book was published in 1971 by Random House Publishing Company. I'm going to take you to page... I'm going to take you to page 14. We're going to drop down to second the third paragraph it reads a cardinal fact of life in the United States which Jews were quick to perceive was that caste was determined by color not creed there's a caste system here if you're white you can surpass all other nationalities or ethnicities but if you're black you're on the bottom of the totem pole there's a caste system in America it says, only in America was the Jew a white man. See that? Only in America was the Jew a white man. Any other place, you had dark-skinned Jews, you had tan Jews, you had various shades of brown Jews. It says, the view Jews and Negroes held on themselves and of each other was determined with fatal finality by the existence of of that peculiar institution, slavery. In the 15 and 1600s, if you were black, you were a slave. That's a caste system. And that image has not left this place since the transatlantic slave trade. Let's go down here. The American version of this ancient and traditional form of bondage was so ferocious that it seemed different in kind if not in quantity, from any previously known form of servitude introduced by the Spaniards in Haiti in 1502 and spread malignity across the body of the New World. This is where it all started, that race, the complexion problem. By the outbreak of the Civil War, a majority of the people living in the Confederacy were slaves. In Cardoza, South Carolina, more than 60% of the population was Negro. Charleston wealth was created by the slave trade and declined with its end. Now, if the Spaniards created this in 1502, what was going on in Europe? Prior to that, we were being shipped out based on the fact of skin complexion. So this radiated from the European colonies all the way over into the Americas. This one, that race card came into play. Let's go to page 17. And let's start here. It says, In the spirituals, those musical cries of agony, Negro slaves, dimly disguised as Hebrews, became the anointed of benevolent God. Moses spoke for the Negroes when he told old Pharaoh to let my people go. And Joshua fit the battle of Jericho with the weapons most readily available to the plantation chattel. Marching feet, clapping hands, and the voices of the multitudes. If Methuselah, Samson, and Daniel were witness for my power, so too was the black singer who warned his, matters, warned his masters that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was on his side. The God who weighed Nebuchadnezzar in the balance and found him wanting was the same God that put the handwriting on the wall of the plantation prison. For the God that lived in Moses, time is just the same today. Let's go over to this page. 2.12 I'm 
and let's read the top. Let's read at the top. The land of Israel is located in Western Asia and borders on North Africa. All of the native inhabitants of that region were non-white. See that? When Spain expelled its Jews in 1492, we talked about the 1500s, when that caste system came into play, many of them went to Africa. Many of who? Many of the Jews went to Africa. Why? Because they were dark complexion. Just like we read, many people in America thought that all Jews were white. It was opposite in Spain from the 1400s backwards. It seems probable that some of them were brought later to America as slaves. The spirituals never sing of African rivers. It's always the Jordan or the Red Sea. They don't sing about African chiefs or kings. It's David or Moses or some other Jewish characters from the Bible. See that? So it's telling you right there that the Negroes are the Jews. And in America, it flipped around due to the fact of skin complexion. Okay? I will bring this out till I turn blue in the face. If I could bring it out on every video to prove a point, I will. But this is Nature Knows No Color Line by J.A. Rogers. It was copyrighted in 1952, renewed in 1980. Third edition. On page 123, and I'm only bringing this out because I showed you what the caste system was in America after the 1500s. So this is before the 1500s, so look what it says. This is on page 123, it says, Waite says an interesting gradation of all shades down to the black is exhibited by the Jews, especially dark were the Jews of Spain and Portugal. The Portuguese Jews were very dark, says Richard. See that? They were very dark. Look at this. So dark were the Jews, especially of Portugal and southern Spain, that many whites thought all Jews were black or dark. So everything reversed. All right, let me show you another article. Look at this article. I think I read this in the paper about mm, maybe two weeks ago. But it says, millions given up organized religion. It says millions. Why are they giving up their religions? Obviously, it's not the truth. What are the organized religions that are here in America? Mostly Christianity. Different sects of Christianity. Millions given up organized religion. Also because a lot of people weren't backed by their religions or by their religious affiliations to different organizations when it came to the COVID testing or the COVID vaccination. So a lot of people left where they thought their religious beliefs were. They left the organizations. It says, I take a picture of the whole thing, but it says America's fast growing movement, the knowns. Now this is another organization that people are flocking to. Another organization that still doesn't have the truth. It says here, and this is, of course, you can see it says the USA Today uh, network paper. And it says they are ex-missionaries and military pilots, yoga instructors, and computer programmers. In other words, these are educated people leaving their religions. Leaving Christianity. Leaving whatever they're into to, to join other affiliates in search of what? In search of the truth. So the world is changing. The world is in what? Darkness. Verse 21, for thy law is burnt. Therefore no man knoweth the things that are done of thee or the works that shall begin. How many times have our law been burnt? If the heathen are not in control, then who's in control? Allah has been burnt during the time of the Maccabees, 
They tried to burn our law. During the time of Hitler, he tried to burn our books. Okay? All praise to the Most High for establishing King James to rewrite these books. But our book has been through crematories and incinerators. Verse 21, for the law is burnt, therefore no man knoweth the things that are done of thee, or the works that shall begin. Some countries wouldn't even allow you to bring these books into their country. They check your luggage and your baggage just to make sure you didn't bring this in, especially like China and Japan and Russia, some kind of countries. You couldn't take a Bible into that land. Verse 22, but if I found grace before thee, send the Holy Spirit into me. And I shall write all that have been done in the world since the beginning, which were written in thy law, that men may find the path, thy path, and that they which will live in the latter days may live. That's us. We found it. We keep the Sabbath to the best of our ability. We, we keep his feast days to the best of our ability. We found it. And he answered me saying, go thy way, gather the people together and say unto them that they seek thee not for 40 days. So this is the beauty of Ezra's. The Most High established his covenants through Ezra's to rewrite this thing. Not only that, he gave him a slew of other books to rewrite. So Ezra's knew this too. That in the last days, people would be in darkness if they did not spend their time looking for the light to save themselves from death. Those that seek, seek this light would be scarcely saved. Think about that. All of us who will find this light, we're going to be scarcely saved from this world. Look at 2 Ezra chapter 14, verse 42. Why? Because we're still dealing with tribulation while we're here. All this tribulation we're dealing with. More so now than ever before, our spirits are vexed every time we walk out our door with all these agendas, homosexual agenda, these vaccination agendas, all these different things we deal with on a day to day basis. One thing about the vaccinations uh, that a lot of people don't understand is that the vaccinations uh, make a lot of people sterile. You know, that, that's the issue the sterileness of vaccinations. And it's not just COVID-19, all vaccinations, even epidurals can make people sterile. That's why there's a big controversy with the vaccinations now with the babies, women who are pregnant. Uh, verse 42, 2nd Ezra chapter 14, verse 42. It reads, the highest gave understanding unto the five men. And they wrote the wonderful visions of the night that were told which they knew not. And they sat 40 days and they wrote in the day and at night a bread. As for me, I spoke in the day and I held not my tongue by night. In 40 days, they, the most I was using him as a vessel to speak the words and they was writing these books. Kind of like the book of Eli with Denzel Washington. If you've seen that movie at the very end, he was the vessel that was speaking. It was another man writing and recording what he was saying. Verse 44, in 40 days, they wrote 204 books. And it came to pass when the 40 days were fulfilled that the highest spoke saying, the first that thou hast written published openly that the worthy and unworthy may read it. That's what we're reading today. The unworthy, can't they, not, can they, can't they read the 66 books? We can't stop them. So the worthy and unworthy, the unworthy is also our people who don't want to change. They read the book. They don't keep the laws. That makes them unworthy. The worthy are the saints. The unworthy are those who do not change. And it says that they may read it. It doesn't say that they will read it. It says that they may read it. So the Gentiles are also the unworthy. When we look at Ezekiel chapter 2 and 4, what did he say? What did he say about the Gentiles? Ezekiel chapter 3 and 4. 
Look at what he says. He says, And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech. Just like Joseph in the beginning. He said he didn't understand the Egyptian language. For thou art not sent to a people of strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel, not to many people of a strange speech and of an hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto you. See that? If the Gentiles got this, they would have hearkened. You wonder why our books were burned. And then all of a sudden they're printed. And then there's a new establishment amongst a new people who are claiming to be Jews. Remember Bulan, the proselyte of the Khazars? He was a Gentile. He turned instantly into a proselyte of the Jewish uh, diaspora. But he wasn't an Israelite. He wasn't even from the stock of Israel. You got all kinds of books written about the King Bulan and the Khazars over there in Europe in the caves. When the Israelites were fleeing from Rome, they went up into the mountains to get away from Rome because they were going to kill them in wine presses and things like that. They were looking for places to, to reestablish themselves and they went to these Khazars and told them about the law, statutes, and commandments and told them that was the way to uh, everlasting life. And so they made that change and became proselytes, which are converts. They are not true Hebrew Israelites. All right, now this may make some of you mad. We're not Israelites by blood. Uh, but this is called Jewish proselytism, a phenomenon in the religious history of early medieval Europe. 10th Annual Rabbi Louis Feinberg Memorial Lecture, March 3rd, 1987. Uh, these lectures are generated from, from the notes of Jewish history in the 20th century. February 22nd, 1977. Now I'm about to go into some things that's going to just make you scratch your head a little bit. And this is going to talk about these proselytes that are in Europe. Let's start here. And it says here, Israel in the year 1102 has written this book with his own hand. This brief fragment yielded several valuable pieces of information. Obadiah has lived at the turn of the 11th century. He was the member of the family of the Normanic stock. Remember I had mentioned that in my series of videos about the tribe of Dan and so forth and how when they went into Ireland they were conquered by the Normans. So this Normanic stock were Caucasian people. This Normanic stock also destroyed the Israelites who lived in Spain, Portugal, and Italy. Also as, also as well as France. So remember that Normanic stock. And, it says, and this is also during the 11th century, if you didn't forget. And after his conversion, he had become expert in the Hebrew language and in Hebrew calligraphy the colophon itself, as well as the page of the prayer book, provided examples of Obadiah's own handwriting. Obadiah was a man who converted to being a Jew from a Caucasian stock. Moreover, the Arabic title on the recto of the same manuscript page made it evident that Obadiah had learned that language as well. And this information had to be coupled with the fact that, according to Master Baruch's letter, he was also expert in reading of Christian literature, the use of the term Normanic, and the Colophon suggesting that the language of that literature was Latin. These few fragments of Hebrew documents thus describe the man of learning of the time of the first crusade from the West. 
Greece during the Byzantine Empire as well, who in the course of his peregrinations in cities of the Near East had studied the literature and beliefs of the Jews, which he adopted which he adopted as his own, as well as the Arabic vernacular of the inhabitants of that region. Why, do, why was he studying Arabic vernacular? Because the Arabic vernacular is the closest thing to Hebrew language. Also, some of their customs is closer to the Hebrew customs. It says, now as it happens, no other figure of precisely this type is known in the annals of the First Crusade. It was thus clear that the study of the men's writings might yield valuable information on Crusade history on the Jews of the Middle Ages. On proselytism and on other subjects of salient interest. Thus, ever since those early fragments were found, scholars investigating the Cairo Gen Geniza have been on the lookout for other texts pertaining to him and not without success because he was studied up. Besides the above mentioned manuscript fragments already Jacob Mann in his 1930 essay published several broken pages from a chronicle or memoirs written by Obadiah one leaf of which had been published previously by E.N. E. Adler in 1919 an additional valuable fragment of the Chronicle was discovered in 1953 by S.D. Goltin and still another by A. Schreiber of Budapest in 1954. Further developments in the study of Obadiah now make feasible the following examination of his fragmentary memoirs and related texts and their arrangement in chronological order. Why is this important? Because what you are seeing is the beginning of the Jewish or Khazar Empire pushing their image throughout the world. Let's go over here to page 38. Now let's speed up the pace. This is going to give more in depth. It says the Khazars were a Turkic speaking group of tribes living in the vast region between the Volga and the Nipir rivers and what is now southern Russia. We know about them from certain Arabic and Russian sources but particular from several Hebrew texts of great historical importance which somehow have managed to survive into modern times. Because Dan was all in the northern areas, Naphtali and Levi, so he had footprints of information that was all over Europe. The best known of these Hebrew sources is a detailed exchange of correspondence between the most eminent Jewish political person, personality of the 10th century. This is when they started to convert. From the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th century is when they all started to convert to Judaism. They created a religion out of it. Has thy I been Shapru of Cordova and King Joseph of the Khazars who ruled in the middle of that century. In addition, there is another lengthy letter discovered by Solomon Scheister in the Cambridge Geniza collection over 75 years ago that was composed by another anonymous Khazarian Jew and sent also to Hastai at about that same time. Example, circa 950 or 960 CE. We shall discuss below still another document of the Khazars discovered some years ago also in the Cambridge Geniza collection. The letters exchanged between Hastai and the Khazars has stimulated debate among scholars among since they were published. Debate which has in our own day spilled over into the public domain, both King Joseph and the anonymous Khazar emphasized in their letters to Hastai, written from different places, that the religion practiced by the Khazars was not merely monotheism or Jewish ten sectarianism, such as we encounter frequently in the history of religions, but bona fide rabbic Judaism. This Judaism, according to the Hebrew letters, was instituted in Khazaria 
by a willful act of the part of an early Khazar king that was instilled among the Khazarian people by teachers brought to the Khazar lands by King Obadiah in the 9th century. The Hebrew letters are also in agreement that Judaism was widespread among the Khazars. And not only among their rulers, or what some call the ruling class, Judah Halavai based his famous 11th century dialogue, the Khazari, on the historical circumstance of conversion of the Khazar king. But the world of Christian scholarship, which was acquainted with Halavai's Sephardic Jew, Namadis, who had excellent sources of information, writes in the 13th century that the number of the French Jews alone was 200,000. These are all nomadic Caucasian people converting to being Israelites, converting to being Jews. They are all proselytes. Jews inhabited hundreds of cities and villages in medieval France, and when they were expelled in 1306, they moved eastward in a mighty stream. Both in France and in Germany, the medieval Jews had an intense Hebrew culture. The scholars and authors of whom Arthur Kosler appears to have known nothing. So he's slandering Arthur Kosler, but what he's really doing is telling us that they were converts, that they are not the true Jews that's written of the Bible, that their lineage does not go back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's just adding more information that Arthur Kosler didn't know into this manuscript. It says, wrote hundreds of books on diverse subjects in Hebrew, not in French or German. The movement eastward of German Jews can be demonstrated by the widespread of Judeo-German, which became Yiddish. This is the language that they speak. It's not the true ancient Hebrew. It's not the Lashawan Kadash. Virtually all through the Eastern Europe diaspora, European diaspora. So what happened here? You had numerous Caucasians converting to being Jewish. So what happened to the real Jews? They got pushed in the South, South Spain. They got pushed into West Africa. Some of them fled to the Americas. Some of them fled to the islands. Some of them, some of them went into slavery. They end up being slaves to these same people that we're reading about right here. When they had to flee from France and went into Germany, when they proselyte, when they became converts, they took on the same penalties that the original Israelites took on for the first hundred years until they were allowed to go back to the lands and they were the only ones who were allowed to go back to the lands, not the real Jews. Here's another book, it's called Islam in Britain. From 1558 to 1685. We're going to go to page 170. This is for you brothers and sisters who want the truth. Alright. And it reads here. It says... And this is how the whitewashing came about. And you'll see that these Normanic Jews who became Jews didn't even want to go back to the land. They didn't want to go back to Jerusalem. They liked it right where they were. But the Christians were pushing them to go back to the land. It says here, Indeed, the few Jews in England, those Moranos, refugees who had settled in the second half of the 16th century, did not express, nas did not express nationalistic aspirations at all. It was not Jews, but Britons and other European and New England Protestants who through sermons and biblical exegesis, however you say that, exegesis, we'll have to look that one up, discussed the Jews, debated their restoration or non-restoration, and planned their destiny. The Jews were never involved in the English discussion of their faith. Early in the 17th century, the Venetian rabbi Leon de Mordona made no mentions of desire to restore during his conversation with his English visitors. The charge notes Mark R. Cohen that 
diaspora of the Jews in the 17th century always had their eyes on Palestine was still a thing of the future. Even after 1655, when Jews were unofficially allowed into England, they did not participate in the restoration debate, nor had they done so. Would they have been willing to voice hopes for restoration which could have resulted in their expulsion from England by Englishmen who did not want them to reside in the realm in the first place? So you can see here, they didn't even want to participate in going back to Israel because they never was there. These are all converts. So they were trying to push an image for them to go back. So it wasn't them, the people of the land, who wanted to go there. It was the European nations, the EU, that pushed that. Um, look at this one. This is page 171. It says, it did not matter of Englishmen. It did not matter to Englishmen that there were no militarized Jews in the whole of Christendom, let alone Jews with the preparedness of the willingness to fight the Muslim enemies of their Christian enemies. What mattered was that the Jews could be made to fight the Muslims and win for England and Christ. So who is this war for? For England. So those people who are dwelling over there, like Christ said in Revelation 2 and 9, I know who say they are Jews, but are not, but the synagogue of Satan. That's why they don't like to uh, bring that up. I want to bring I want to bring this out just to show you that they know that the Jews are black. It says here, this is page 179. It says, no wonder that the followers of Sevi were described as having fair complexions. The restoring Jews were not that dark skin so they knew that the original Jews were dark skin it says the restoring Jews were not dark skin orientals but were of the West these are the new Jews while the Muslims were alien and strange the Jews were familiar and armed after our fashion the English fashion as one writer had written in 1607 the followers of Sevi were either going to fight and conquer the Turks or to have Palestine offered to them by a frightened Batha. In whichever way they proceeded, the fair Jews, meaning white Jews, were to seize Palestine and all the Levant from the dark skinned Muslims. Isn't that something? Very interesting. Now you should understand that the real Jews are in exile and the Jews who are in that land are not the Jews. And you wonder why a lot of people are becoming knowns, taking on the knowns religion as the article that we read. Second Ezra chapter 14 verse 46. Let's read this. So yeah, the Gentiles will change quick. You want to tell them that they can become a Jew? They'll change over quick. They'll do everything that you tell them to do. That's in the scriptures. Let's read uh, 2 Corinthians 14 and 46 again. It says, But keep the seventy last, that thou mayest deliver them only to such as be wise among the people. Who are the wise among the people? Those who are worthy. Those who are worthy can read the next section of books. And these books are like, the book of Baruch, the second book of Baruch, second Ezra, uh, the remaining chapters of Esther, the 12 patriarchs. You know, there's various books, there's various manuscripts that were left, but those are for the worthy, those who have understanding. That's why we always tell brothers, don't read the book of Enoch yet. You have to get understanding first. Verse 47, for in them is the spring of understanding, the fountain of wisdom, and the stream of knowledge. See that? And I did so. So Ezra received all of these things. The most I just poured out his wisdom and the spirit on him. 
for these men to record everything he said. When our people are in darkness, it's, it's because of our disobedience. The Most High would not shine his face on us unless we turn to him and never turn back to iniquity. Put your trust in him and the Most High will do the rest. Now, first you have to keep his commandments. That's, that's a form of trust in him. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Most High shall be safe. So the Most High is going to protect us if we believe on him and we do what we're asked to do. I don't know where these Christians believe you don't have to do nothing and he'll take care of you. You still got to do something. He gave you hands. He gave you arms. He gave you legs. <laughs> he gave you a brain, eyes, nose, and mouth. If you didn't have to do nothing, you don't need any of those things. You don't need no senses. You don't need nothing. All you need, to, all you need is a brain with faith. But the Most High gave you all these things to be able to work in this truth, to help others. Proverbs chapter, uh, let's go to Revelations chapter 7 and 2. Revelation 7 verse 2. And it reads, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living power. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our power in their foreheads. Now think about, uh, who was we reading about last week? It was Lot in Sodom. That angel couldn't do nothing to destroy Sodom until Lot got out of Sodom. It's the same thing that we're reading right here. The Most High is not going to allow anything to happen to you. Once you're sealed and you stay focused, the Most High ain't going to let nothing happen to you. So, while these saints who are on the earth that are waiting for the Most High to return, you know, we have to wait on our brother and to be sealed. You know, don't you think just because we're here on this earth and we know this truth that that we're just going to just be totally safe? There's nothing going to happen to us. No, we still got to encounter people who are not in the truth. We still got to deal with brother and sisters who are rebellious in this world. We still got to deal with the heathen. Is he going to protect us? He's going to protect us to a certain degree. But when it comes to speaking his word, there's going to be a fight. <laughs> there's going to be a fight when it comes to speaking his word, especially to your own people, because your own people, got it's up to the most high. He can allow them to hurt you. And that's all by example. If he allows them to hurt you, that's by example. So it can set in their minds later, like Paul. Paul killed Stephan. He killed Stephen. And then he had remorse later. It helped Paul to change because Stephen got killed. That was in the truth. You see that? So when it comes to your brethren, it could be for a testimony for them to change by seeing you get injured. Just like Yahweh Shai. We saw him get injured, right? We saw him get beaten, blood everywhere. We read about it. We heard about it. They make movies about it. But that's a testimony for us. You know, to show that while you're in this truth, you can even be beaten. You can experience things that you thought wouldn't happen to you. You know what I mean? For the testimony of somebody else to come into the truth. That's the thing that we don't think about. When you look at Acts chapter 7 and 51, look at how Stephen had to... He, now, Stephen was a disciple, and he was... Uh, in charge of the widows during that time. They had set up some, like a foundation to protect the widows. But uh, Stephen was pulled out of that area and um, challenged by his fellow brother and sisters uh, who was in that 
in that group setting. And uh, when we read this whole chapter, we're, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but we are going to read about, uh, we're going to read about in around verse 51. Because by this time, the discussion has had gotten heated because he was going through the history of his people and he was explaining it to his brother and they was going back and forth about the truth. And um, they still didn't see why he had such a spirit of him spirit on him but then he explains himself here this is uh acts chapter 7 verse 51 he says ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears you do always resist the holy spirit now what is the holy spirit we should all know what the holy spirit is the holy spirit is keeping of his laws statutes and commandments that's the holy spirit loving your brethren as you love yourself that's part of the holy spirit it says, ye stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which show before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of of angels and have not kept it. The law is important. The law requires action. These brethren were not keeping the law. For us to start off the class by turning and facing towards Jerusalem, that is a law for us to turn and face towards Jerusalem. You understand? This is why we have, like I said, this is why we have a body. The most I wants to see us make actions. We take a shofar, we blow it on the new moon. That is a law. That is an action. The laws are actions. Everything we do from our mouth to our eyes, he said, don't look at evil things. Eat dietary law, dietary law foods that I put in your place. You know, he's telling us things to do with this body. You understand? Verse 54, it reads, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they can gnash on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of the Most High, and Yahushai standing on the right hand of the Most High, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of the Most High. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. They stomped him out. And then they stoned him. See that? So Stephen was sealed, but he still had to refute his brethren. His brethren are what you call scoffers today. Just like our people today. A lot of them are scoffers. And their job is to frustrate you. Their job is to make your work a little harder than what you thought it would be. Their job is to make your faith stronger. It's supposed to make your head harder in the truth. Second Peter's chapter three, verse four. Second Peter's chapter three, verse four. Let's start at three. Second Peter's three, verse three. It says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. That was the first example of it right there. What we read in Acts chapter seven. First example of the scoffers. And now it's worse. It's worser than what it was then. It says, walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? That's what they tell us. He ain't coming. But since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were for from the beginning of the creation. So here you have it. You have, um, you have, you have these scoffers, right? And you have the brothers that are sealed. So you got brothers who are dying along the way, trying to get to that salvation. But there's still brothers that need to be sealed. Like we read in Revelation chapter 7 before someone's calling me. I was trying to call me during this time. But let me tell you. Verse 5, let's read this. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of the Most High, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water, and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. 
but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in star. I want to read to verse 8. Reserved unto fire against the day of judgment. The Most High says that fire is coming. It's just a matter of time. The reason why it's coming and people can't see it, these scoffers, they can't see the fire, fire coming. But the Most High operates differently from man. That's why I want to read the verse. Eight. It says, and perdition of ungodly men. But be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Most High as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So though the fathers have fallen asleep and people say, where's the uh, promise of his coming? It's going to come. It's just a matter of time. How's this place going to go out? By nuclear fire. It's going to burn the elements that we see on an everyday basis. All these elements are going to burn up. That's the promise. That's the prophecy. The most I said, just wait for it. It's going to come. We see the rainbow, don't we? Then he promised that he would put a rainbow up and that he never flood the earth again. That's part of the promise. But how can we not see that the most High is going to send fire on earth too? That's coming. Let's look at another one who had to refute his own brother. Let's read uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2, and let's go to verse 23. And this is about the prophet Elisha. Elisha was a powerful prophet that came after the likes of the prophet Elijah, who was also another powerful prophet. But Elisha, you know, we always think that these prophets were nice men. and You know, they kind of have a lot of... Um, this generation sympathy and empathy towards people, but look at how Alicia dealt with these young children, which were probably not children, they were more like goats, kids. Second Kings chapter two, verse 23, and it says, and he went up from this unto Bethel. And as he was going up, by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him. Was not Stephen mocked? And said unto him, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. He's talking about his bald head. All right. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Most High. And there came forth two she bears out of the woods and tear forty and two children of them. And he went from thence to Mount Carmel, and from thence he returned to Samaria. Do y'all see this? Now, today's time, this would be called world star hip-hop because Alicia, he didn't even attempt to try to stop. <laughs> he just watched the, the she-bears tear up the goats. So the spirit of Alicia's was the spirit of the Most High. That's what you have to understand. These children mocked him. It doesn't matter if they're children or not. The Most High don't care about children unless they believe in him. They don't care about the babies. They're born to take this word into their spirit, into their vessel. That's the whole point of them being born. And if they're not trying to keep these laws, even as a baby, the Most High gives them a chance. He gives them mercy for them to grow and learn. He gave Yahushua time to grow and learn. But like the Most High says in Jeremiah, I knew you from the womb. He already knows what a lot of these vessels are about. Whatever's in their forehead, he knows the evil that's been being done in their vessels. Babies too. You know what they're going to do in the future. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. Jeremiah 1 and 5 and it reads, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, O power, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the most I said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, 
for I am with thee to deliver you. Save the power. See that? So the most I already knew what this young man was going to do. Just like you brothers and sisters. He already knew what y'all was capable of doing. For, you, for, the, for him to wake you up into this truth, he already knew you in the womb that you was going to come into this truth. He already knew those was going to come into the truth that was going to fall away too. He already knew. Many are called, but few are chosen, right? Let's hope that we are the chosen. Let's hope. Um, let's go to Psalms chapter 31, verse 18. Let the lion lips be put to silence, which speak grievous things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee, before thee, sons of men. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Don't worry, the most I'll take care of you. Don't worry. You do what he say do and he'll take care of you. You are different from everyone else. They don't like us to tell each other that, but we are different from everyone else. The Most High is raising up a special people unto himself to be priests and kings among the nations. It's like he just told Jeremiah, he said, I set you upon the nations. Psalms chapter 37. Psalms chapter 37, verse 25. Psalms 37, verse 25. It reads, I have been young and now am old. Look at this testimony. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. It's a beautiful thing to keep these laws in the Father Yahweh shot to the Father, isn't it? Here's a testimony. He said, I've never seen nobody young or old and forsaken by the Father. He is ever merciful. And Linda, you ever wonder why $20 or a check come out of nowhere? You'd be looking for some money and boom, out of nowhere. Somebody owed you some money that you forgot about years ago. It could be the IRS. They mess around and send you some money. And his seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good, and dwell forevermore. For the Most High loveth judgment, and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever. But the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. And I've seen that too. I've seen some brothers, man, that did some wicked and evil things, and they ain't here no more. I've seen a brother hit his mom in the head with a skillet. And thought that he was going to get away with it. He got away with it in court. But that brother ended up dying later on in life. And his mama still living. So yeah. You got to honor your parents. There's a lot of things that go on. You just got to outlive it. <laughs> and you'll see the difference. You'll see the end result. The most I bless you to see it. What's that one scripture uh, in um, Sarai? It says the is the most I said, there's three things that I love. He said, he said, a man that agrees with his wife, a man that uh, uh, has righteous brethren around, and he said, the downfall of a man's enemy. That's the third. The downfall of a man's enemy. You just got to outlive it. The most I see you through it. Yeah. And I'm sure all of you have testimonies like that. Things have happened or people were mean to you and you've seen the end result. You know, and uh, it's just amazing. Uh, I'm going to end with that. I'm gonna, I guess the class is rather short today. But I, I just wanted to just touch on the blessings of the Father by giving us this word and making our heads harder than the rest of our family members and friends and people about, who are out there. 
the Most High has blessed us with this knowledge and this understanding. And don't ever leave it behind. This is more powerful than a credit card. This is more powerful than your vitamins and your and your medicines. This word is true. And it's going to see. This is the word of the Lord of hosts. I took you from the pastures and from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone and have destroyed all the enemies in your path. I will make you a great name among the great ones of the earth. I will assign a place for my people in Israel. There I will plant them and they shall dwell in their own land. Thank <laughs> you.